We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These words from the Declaration of Independence are familiar to many of us, and yet it took 143 years for women to get the right to vote, and 189 years for black people to get the right to vote. And still today, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are still only words for many people. Here in Boston, life expectancy varies by 30 years, depending on where you live. In Roxbury, with many poor and black people, life expectancy is 59 years. In the Back Bay, wealthy and mostly white, life expectancy is 91 years. It's tough to have liberty when you are in prison. The United States incarcerates 716 people for every 100,000 people. Our rate of incarceration is more than five times higher than most countries in the world. Millions of people in our country don't have health care, a decent job, good education, a home they can afford, and that makes it pretty hard to pursue happiness. So on this show, you are going to meet people who are making it possible to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. People today who are making the words of the Declaration of Independence come true. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, today, uh, we're very honored to have uh, Celia Wislow, recently retired top elected official of the uh, largest healthcare workers union in the state of Massachusetts and New England. Welcome, Celia. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, we'd like to uh, learn a little bit about your background, where you're from, and uh, how you got the values you had to uh, work as a leader in the union. Can you well, tell us something about that? Sure. Well, I wasn't raised to be a union leader. I was a young girl with two uh, scientists mm. for f families. Mm. I grew up in L.A., and when I was away at school, uh, my first year, my father sort of lost it and cut all the kids off. And um, so I didn't become an engineer. Um, I started working as a clerical worker and within a year ended up at Boston City Hospital, um, which had a union. And uh, I think I got a lot of my values from my father. You know, you, hmm. decide, you tell the truth, you try to find out what's at the bottom of anything. You know, you experiment, you try things, and uh, you push back, because he was a little Polish tough guy, you know? And I think I learned some of that from him. Mm. I huh. then found that, you know, I was bored at City Hospital. It was a wonderful place to work, but, you know, I had been going to school and all this, so I mm. started looking around. And um, I got, we had a, a union there, um, though no one could really saw it because it wasn't really visible. Uh, we would get raises every so often and a woman named Therese Murray who later became the Senate president oh, right. was working for nine to five and organized a bunch of the older ladies and young girls to, uh, and we were girls back then, you know, and, 18 and, this, and 19. And this was what year, Celia? This is 1973 or four. 1973. And we wow. would meet over at the, the, the Jesuit hall across the street and she teaches us about some of our rights and stuff. And so we mm. started to go to union meetings. Um, and it was not really appreciated by uh, Tom Kennedy and Matt McGrath. They kept mm. moving them around. And they were little, you know, Irish gangsters, I would say. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I learned my tenacity from my father and my mother. Um, and I learned about the union just by stumbling into it and being organized by somebody who organized me to be an organizer. Uh, and that was the beginning. So what was the union? Uh, you mentioned there were these Irish gangsters. What was going on with the union uh, back in those days in the early 70s? Well, it actually started in the late 60s. Uh, AFSCME <coughs> started organizing parts of the city of Boston under Kevin White. Then Tom Kennedy had this little local of cable splices and stuff from the police department, started organizing. So Kevin White, being the strategic thinker he was, decided to give everyone the right to join a union, but he split them up among different unions mm. so that he could keep them from, you know, taking him on directly. 
And mm -hmm. so he gave Kennedy the clerical and technical workers, which was, I was a clerk at City Hospital. And he gave them uh, what we would call no-show jobs. Mm -hmm. And if someone goes back through the archives of the Herald or the Globe, there's this one uh, article where Kevin White says, you know, that was the best investment. Those are no-show jobs because they got exposed. I ever made, it kept a whole lot of people really quiet in the city of Boston. Mm -hmm. So he did it intentionally. He bribed them. So, so you started going to union meetings. Uh, uh, Teresa Murray encouraged you to do that. And, and what was happening then when you went? Uh, well, at first they were yeah. small, like there was like seven people in the room and they uh -huh. weren't sure, expecting people to be there. But it started growing over time. And we found other people in the city, in the union, who wanted to start coming. And I think my favorite scene was when one of the uh, people, from, I think it was from UMass, was reading a financial statement, at, you know, to the President Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, these big guys, that's all I remember, I was a little girl, these were big guys mm -hmm. walking towards all of us. And we were mostly women. Mm -hmm. um, and we were all in the rows, and two of my coworkers, Emily and uh, Joni, said, all right, dear, pick up your chair. This is going to get messy. And they both picked up their chairs. These are older ladies. Put them over their shoulders. And I'm like, Joni whips out this flashlight that's this long. She says, I carry it just for times like this. And then Adele Berry, who is one of the people who I originally got to know, had to be 70, 65, mm. starts walking towards them by herself and goes, go ahead, hit me. Mm. I look really no good on the news. Do it. I'm, I'm begging you to do it. <laughs> and the guys put their hands up and walked back because they didn't really? know what to do. So yeah. that was sort of what it was like until the local got trustee. Right. So where did you get the, the guts and the other folks to, to do that, you think? I mean, that doesn't sound like something uh, little guess, girls would normally do. I honestly don't. No, I think they taught me more than, I mm. mean, I didn't, I mean, I grew, grew up, my father taught me to hit and box and fight and oh, sit yeah? and, as mm. a young lady, so if you ever got in trouble, just clock the sucker, you know, he was like, mm -hmm. he taught me some really good moves, and, but I never thought of using, it wasn't mm. like, and then when I had to, you know, I looked at them, they told me what to do. I so, followed directions. That's great. So, so what happened after that? I know you became interested in changing the union, so it was more so democratic. It got, it got trusteed. Uh, we eventually... Maybe got, you could explain what that means. Oh, I'm not sure everybody means knows what SEIU that means. SEIU came in and threw out Kennedy and Matt McGrath. Well, how did that happen? That doesn't just happen automatically, well, uh, right? We were doing all this stuff, and we were making it more public and started hitting mm -hmm. into the newspapers. Mm -hmm. And they were trying to organize, SEIU was trying to organize state workers. Mm -hmm. So here's SEIU being you know, shown as corrupt, just as they were trying to expand into state workers as organizing. Mm -hmm. So they took them out. They took away, they took the union away from them, busted into the office you know, got them arrested. Really? The, yeah. the parent union did this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, those guys got arrested? Yep. They, wow. were, they were arrested because he went down to the bank to try to clear out all the cash, and the, the bank had heard it on the news, and they arrested him on the spot. Wow. Wow. So uh, what happened after that? Can you tell well, us? Well, then, uh, after the trusteeship was over, <laughs> um, there was about two or three years where the trustee actually ran and w won, but he... he he wasn't from the local, and it, uh, I don't want to go into a long story about that, mm -hmm. but there were some problems with the dues and, you know, mm -hmm. dues vote and stuff, and a bunch of us decided to run, and the first time it was three women, Nancy Mills, Betty Jean Andrews, and myself, mm -hmm. and uh, I was, uh, we ran, we won, we didn't, I'm not sure how we expected to win, I mean, we worked really hard, but we did it all based on having spent a number of years organizing against Kennedy and then, you know, meeting out the members along the way. And mm -hmm. we won. We were the first all-women slate wow. uh, in Massachusetts. And, and what was that like, running? Uh, tell, me, tell us a little bit about that campaign, if you want to call it that, well, it was to a campaign, get elected. Yeah. It was a campaign for, uh, you know, a better a better union. I'm not mm -hmm. sure how developed our vision was. We wanted mm -hmm. to organize. Uh, we wanted to grow. We wanted to get rid of any corruption that was in the local. 
and we wanted to bring rank and file members up. Mm -hmm. Nancy was a staff person, but the rest of us were rank and file. And we won. And then it began a, a period of six years where we really started changing the union. We mm -hmm. actually had organizers for the first time. Mm -hmm. We uh, did more social justice things. We went to the Martin Luther King events in New York, in D.C. Mm -hmm. We got people more involved in social justice issues. And that was about six years uh, under Nancy. Um, mm -hmm. And that was, I was president, but she was in fact in charge because she mm -hmm. was the executive director. And then the structures changed so that the top officers had to be not staff, but rank and file. Um, oh, okay. So we made a decision to do that. And how, how did that happen from staff to rank and file people like you who came up starting as a clerk, as you said, at City well, Hospital? I, I think for people like me, we kept feeling like um, staff would manipulate us and mm. operate us and tell us what to do. And they were sort of the, the power behind the scenes. And at a certain point, after enough years, you get frustrated and angry with that. So I think that's where it came from. In the end, when I left, we've now gone back to staff can run, mm -hmm. you know, under 1199. And it's mm -hmm. not my model, but uh, I can see the rationale for it because many pe workers come out of the workplace, go on staff, learn what they need to know, mm -hmm. and then run for office. And mm -hmm. uh, I still think it was the right decision back in 285. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it sort of stopped the influence of outs, out, outside forces on the local, um, but it had its limits too. Yeah, and how did that change happen from staff to having to we be? We had to change the bylaws. And so I, we had a convention, yeah. we organized around it, we had bylaws proposals. Um, we, it was sort of a fight because the staff wasn't particularly happy uh. with that. Um, and. Uh, we organize members into a rank-and-file caucus to get them passed, and they pass. Right. So could you explain a little bit to people who don't know much about unions what benefits the unions pr provide uh, to the workers? And you mentioned also uh, you got the union involved in social justice issues. Right. Can you explain a little bit about uh, what you mean by that and the yeah. benefits? So, so w uh, most unions are used to, you know, when you go back 20, 30 years, we're about negotiating mm -hmm. good pay, benefits, health sure. insurance, you know, workplace issues only, sort sure. of economic workplace issues. Mm -hmm. And we were from a younger generation, and we, had, like I had been involved in the anti-war movement when I was younger. Sure. Um, and so we had, I came in there with a bigger vision of what was going on in the world, and our local was, you know, 70% women, lots oh. of people of color, at least down at City Hospital. Sure. And those are economic, real social issues for people. It just the union had made a decision. Mm -hmm. They don't do that. And um, we decided that, in fact, that was the role of a union. And I think it was mm -hmm. happening in a lot of the country. A lot of, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of SEIU locals, but other locals were getting more involved outside of the the workplace alone and out in the community. Mm. Um, and that was what made it exciting. You yeah. know? And how did that process work? How did you get you know, a clerk at City Hospital or someone who's working there to be involved in larger things? Well, for example, I was there during the busing crisis. Mm. And I was a ward secretary, so I don't, but I, we were all friends. So mm. when they was gonna be, there was gonna be a, uh, People from Columbia Projects were going to go down to the beach in South Boston mm -hmm. and go use the beach, and it was a really tense. A whole bunch of us decided to go down and be supportive. Mm. Idiots that we were, we were in our bathing suits, <laughs> you know, with flip-flops on, which you don't want to be in a little bus stop with a bathing suit and flip-flops because you can't run. But we started getting more involved in those issues, oh. and uh, I think there was the influence of progressive people who had come to work at the hospital, sort of, you know, we would get our favorite are you a group running through, handing out leaflets, or May Day flags, and yeah. we'd sit in the cafeteria going, there goes one again, but it was a sort of city hospital, I'll say that more yeah. than the city hall, but city hospital was sort of, you know, every nationality, mm -hmm. every language, every social issue, immigration, anything you 
wanted was part of the day-to-day -day conversation. And so it wasn't that hard mm -hmm. to get people to expand. Um, I think the racial tensions took years to overcome in terms of after busing, um, mm -hmm. we, so winning support for affirmative action, uh, getting people to support immigration rights. Um, it was fascinating on my board. We were, thought it would be an easy sell because we've been doing so many progressive things on the board. Mm -hmm. Well, the African-American leaders blocked mm. with the white Irish leaders about how those people are taking our jobs. Mm. And the whole conversation blew up. So I stopped it and I went back the next month and I brought all sorts of leaders of ours who are immigrants. Mm. And I just had them sit at the front of the, the, the panel and tell their story of how they got there mm. and what their immigration story was. And by the end of it, the board changed its mind and took a vote wow. supporting immigration rights. Wow. But it was because they listened to the stories of their friends and they had never heard them, never asked, you know, and suddenly, oh, this is real. This is my friend who had to go through this. Well, these and are I, people they knew and worked yeah, with, but they absolutely. never really took the time to right. hear their stories. Uh, we, we do a lot of education in 1199 mm -hmm. and we have an education uh, whole sector of the union and they did a book every couple of years where they would pe take people who are not English speaking or very limited English speaking and have them write their stories, mm. do it on a computer and write their immigration stories mm. and then they would read it out to a big, you know, a couple hundred people meeting of members and wow. every single time the whole place would fall apart, everyone would be crying <coughs> and I think it's been that kind of education and exposure to mm. different ways of looking at a problem that has allowed people to be much more open mm. to changing the world. Yeah, I mean, and what are the benefits, both on a practical and educational level, does the union provide? I know it provides some, you know, workforce training and other things like that, but I wonder if you can provide that information. A lot of people don't know uh, really what the union does for its own members. Well, we do a lot of, uh, uh, training, get money from employers, to, mm. kid, people can go to college, they can get basic reading and writing skills, computer skills. Uh, we provide um, social events for people. Mm. We provide, provide caucuses, so we have a Latino caucus or African American caucus, so people can get together and share their culture. Um, and I think I, I was at, I'm a Unitarian, whatever that mm. means. <laughs> to give them the world if people don't know. Right. Um, but we talk a lot about how, we're, you know, what's powerful in changing the world is our community and our commitment to each other. And mm. when I was listening to that the other day, I went, that's exactly what a union does. Mm. It creates a community of people who learn to have each other's back, mm. you know, through struggle or through just getting to know each other. Mm. And it gives people a sense of a being a part of a bigger world, not just themselves individually. Mm facing their problems. Yeah, and can you say a little more about how it does that? I mean, you mentioned the different caucuses and the education things. Well, uh, we have ton tons of conventions and conferences where we actually get people together to discuss hmm. issues of the day. We bring in politicians hmm. who are interviewed by our rank and file members, not just by staff or elected officials. Hmm. We uh, <clears throat> let them ask the questions of the politicians, which, hmm. You know, when you're sitting there and you're a personal care attendant and you get to ask a question of Charlie Baker or somebody else, mm -hmm. you know, you suddenly have a d different image of yourself. Mm. You know, you just ask the governor a question and he had to answer you. Right. So I think the we, way we do it is we let rank and file leaders learn to lead. We train them to lead. You know, we train them in the history of the labor movement. We train them in mm. how to run a meeting or speak up. and that's, I think, the lasting imprint, is there's a whole lot of people out there who learned from SEIU and 1199 how to be leaders out in their world, in their community, even if they're no longer in the union. Right, and you mentioned questioning politicians. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the work the union does to elect or oppose politicians? I know you do a fair amount of work, not just endorsing, but also putting yeah, people on the street. We will get a whole cadre of um, political activists from the local. Mm -hmm. We'll train them, we'll put them inside campaigns, especially the weekend before mm -hmm. or a couple weeks before that. We would have staff and members, so we do it together, 
go out and work in the campaign. So knock on doors, take do telephone calling, do all the sort of nuts and bolts kind of mm -hmm. work of an election. And, you know, we show up in our purple and everyone knows, oh, here comes SEIU, here comes 1199, right. the purple people are here. Right. And so it becomes this little co collective of people who um, dig into the political world. And then in turn, uh, we have expectations then that will be listened to mm -hmm. afterwards. Right, and can you talk a little bit about uh, how the union endorses people, uh, whether well, that's, the, uh, you know, yeah, the, how, how the, that's done? The recent past has been um, we have a meeting of rank and file leaders like stewards, or mm -hmm. they call, we call them delegates now mm -hmm. under 1189. They meet and interview the candidates. They get it down to one or two they like, they send the endorse their recommendation to, mm. there's a small executive board in Massachusetts. Mm. The executive board then reviews it and they can't pick somebody else. They can only decide whether or not to go with the, the selection of the, the members. Mm -hmm. And if they pick them, if they agree with the selection, then we commit money and time and work. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really sort of for, much more from the bottom up than when I was at the beginning. You mm -hmm. know. Right. And so what advice would you have for young people who are interested either in social justice and specifically in working in a union? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I understand things have changed since the 1970s at City Hospital right. when you started right. out there. Uh, but uh, I was wondering from your viewpoint and having been a leader in the union so long, what do you think would be helpful for I people to know? I would say two know? things. It, it would be good even if you're a college educated, mm -hmm. young, liberal, whatever, left wing, whatever, mm -hmm. get a job in the industry you're working in. Yep. Get a job there so you know what the work is. If you don't know what the work is, then you're using your mind but not necessarily your heart about what needs to change. Mm -hmm. um, second thing I'd say is, I, I notice women have a really hard time, not a hard time in the work, but they have a hard time understanding that unions are about power Mm -hmm. And being elected is about power, and women have a really hard time grasping that mm -hmm. and feeling like they have it. Guys, it's easy for guys. They just think they inherited it. But um, I found an analogy from my father. Mm -hmm. uh, he gave me about uh, lasers, you know. Mm -hmm. A laser is really just one light bulb or a mm -hmm. strong light bulb that's shown through it takes all the mm. waves that are going everywhere. So think about all your members. They're all mm. over the place. They're going up and down, left, right. And it shines that, all those lights through a ruby, which makes everyone, everyone go up and down in the same direction mm. and the same wavelength. And that can burn a hole through that wall. That light bulb through a ruby can burn a hole through a wall. And that's what I think women in particular, but any labor leader, you are not the power. Mm. You are the laser that can focus the power to get stuff down. But if you think you're it, you're in trouble already. But mm -hmm. if you think your role is to focus it and aim it in a direction that will make a change in mm -hmm. the world, then you can hold on to it mm -hmm. for much longer. No, I understand that. And uh, particularly for women, how would you suggest they uh, try to exercise their power within a union? I know you uh, described some of the things you did early on, but... You really have to push your limits of what you think. Mm -hmm. you, you have to move around, try different things. I mean, you might mm -hmm. not want to be a negotiator, but you might need to learn negotiations, be, have higher office. You need to, I never had a path that I was following that I will just be honest about that. Mm -hmm. I just was bullheaded enough that if someone said you can't go there, I went there. Um, <laughs> and right. So I would uh, tell women to be a little more bullheaded and try. There's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with failing. You've got to try it though. If you don't try, you will always be the one behind the desk. You need to um, be willing to stand up, not just for yourself, for it, but for the people around you. If you're standing up for yourself, you're probably not going to be that comfortable. But if you stand up for people around you and remember that's what you're doing, then you might be tough enough to do it. Yeah, well, you've done that for a long time. And I wonder what's kept you doing this. You mentioned your uh, dad was a scientist. You had gone mm. to college. You know, some people may say, oh, I'll do this for a little while and then go back to school mm -hmm. and become a scientist. You came from an educated yeah. family. What kept you 
in this work, which often can be frustrating working with people who aren't scientists, aren't yeah. maybe so well educated in the formal sense. No, I found it so, it was like once I got thrown out of school, mm -hmm. I was suddenly like, oh, this is so much more fun. Mm. You know, it was like, to me, it was like, oh, I'm not just in my head anymore. This is mm. really interesting. And I, I just made myself learn. Uh, you know, I didn't go to back to school for 20 years. I finally mm. did. Yeah. But I would read things. I would try to learn about the healthcare industry, not just negotiate. You know, mm -hmm. I educated myself as I went along. And when I got bored with something, which I can do, yeah. um, I would go find something else to get in trouble with and right. learn about that. So I think at the point I ran out of things to get my hands into or try new, that's when I started thinking about retiring. I had sort of, mm -hmm. took me 40 years to get through all the places I could get my hands into. But right, and you mentioned earlier one piece of advice you give to younger people who perhaps are thinking about this is to work in a place like uh, Boston Medical Center, which is yeah. now what they call City Hospital. How long do you think someone who's perhaps educated and interested in social justice needs to work in a place like that to sort of get it, what it's like to actually be the people they're going to represent perhaps in the future. I, I had never thought of it like that. I, I mm. mean, I'd say at least a year. If you mm -hmm. think, you know, you need to realize you can't live on this kind of money very well. Mm. You need to realize you're just gonna hate a supervisor and then what are you gonna do about it? You know, mm -hmm. Are you gonna bite your tongue? Are you gonna, you need to figure out how to be friends with people who are not like the kids you knew in college. Mm -hmm. And you need to, you know, actually, and that would take a year at least. I mean, I'd probably say, if you ask me, five years, but that's just mm -hmm. making stuff okay. up. You know, I, I think you really have to understand the lives people live um, to, mm -hmm. to represent them or to learn how to represent them. Mm -hmm. And uh, you could do it otherwise. I just think you'll be, have a better anchor and a mm -hmm. better ability to serve survive the long haul because you'll have understood what they went through. Understood. Like you did. Yeah. You didn't plan it, but... Yeah. Well, mine dead, was accidental. This yeah. was smart right. on my part. But. And do you have any sort of final thoughts uh, for young people coming up in social justice and uh, the workers' rights and the union movement of what's going to be most helpful for them to think about now and in the future? Um, I believe that people active in the union movement are going to be so critical for the future. Mm -hmm. Our economy is so split. Uh, people are suffering so much. And I see around me, including my son, they're, they're making $13, $14 an hour yeah. after having some college. People, the country cannot continue like that. And we need young people. We need people who are committed to go into the trenches, to go into the unions, to mm -hmm. work alongside the unions on social justice in the community, because we have to turn this around. And right. with Trump in place, if we don't turn it around, if we don't turn it around soon, it's only going to get worse. We need every one of those young freedom fighters to right. step forward and fill the breach, because old people like me have retired, but we need other people to step mm -hmm. in and step up. Thanks. Well, you certainly laid the foundation for them to do that. And when we talk about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and we say it's pretty hard to pursue happiness when you're making $13 an hour and trying to live or get a yeah, place to live in Boston, get an apartment on yeah, $13 an hour. People to yeah, afford one or two right. bedroom place. So I think a lot of people don't understand often what unions do. So I really appreciate your taking the time to come in here and explain not only your own history, but the place of unions in our country. And, uh, and I just really appreciate the work that you do and uh, the legacy that you have is certainly being passed on to, to other people today. Well, thank you for the time. So thank you. It's really a, a, an honor to have you no, here, it's an Celia. Honor to be here. Thanks so much. Okay. Okay.